Hello and welcome to another Office Hours Capsule. That's right. Capsule. I'm going to do it every time. <laughs> this is a small section of my Office Hours live streams that are live on Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern. You can come join this wonderful chat. Say hi, chat. Live and ask questions before or after. We do a nice little hang out and talk about the news and other things. We talk about lore, we talk about news, we talk about the game. Uh, we often go off in random tangents about different things. So come join us live for that. But today we are going to be going over the November and December monthly report for Squadron 42. This is not a summary. This is the entire thing. I'm going to read the whole thing from beginning to end and give my interpretation here and there. Maybe fill you in, especially if you haven't been following this because we've been doing this for months now, following the progression of Squadron 42 and Star Citizen. Uh, there may be some spoilers in here. I try to do my best, or CIG does their best not to kind of do full spoilers, but if you're really interested in what's going on at CIG with what they're focusing on with Squadron 42, this is probably the best way of doing it currently, because they don't really give us a lot of updates, sometimes through the progress tracker they do, but this is the best kind of real-time update on what's going on with Squadron. So, without any further ado, as you can tell from this length, this is going to be a big one, so make sure you grab yourself some water, some uh, tea, some food, sit back, relax. Let's get started with the November-December monthly report for Squadron 42. All right. AI content. Towards the end of the year, the AI content team completed a significant number of tasks for Chapter 15. This included prototype animations for crowds and combatants alongside developing several usables and animation sets for dejected characters around the level. The welding engineer also received a lot of improvements. The team made extensive pass on the animations and progressed with the technical challenges of getting the welding helmet, multi-tool parts, and the welding effects working together. Considerable work was done to get a basic version of an AI character interacting with a variety of usables found in living spaces. The bridge crew behavior and animations also received further iteration and are now starting to look polished. Animation supported AI features with box carrying, which resulted in a number of significant visual improvements. A large number of production and organization work was done too, resulting in a comprehensive animation schedule that details all the known work required for Squadron 42 to be a content complete, to be content complete. As part of this, the team will now implement usables and behaviors into the final game levels earlier in the pipeline. So, for those of you who may not be here, this may be your first time actually reading some of these. Uh, Star City or Squadron 42 has several levels complete. Now, complete, meaning they've built everything they wanted to build in it, but they still have to go through testing and other phases. They've gone through most of the early levels. There's something like 23 to 28 levels. I always forget those ones. It's in the 20s, upper mid, mid to upper 20s in terms of chapters. So they're getting content complete on animations or on AI content, which seems like they're finishing up the content that they need for the AI overall. Uh, much of the later levels are done and much of the earlier stuff is done. So that's just this middle section, many of which had been languishing for a long time <laughs> with some stuff just not being updated. So they're finally getting around to it. So that's, that's the kind of context of what's going on. But we're seeing a lot more behavior that is not directed towards belligerence. This is the, some of the first time we've seen, seems like non-combat AI updates for AI content, which is nice. AI features. Last year, the team complete implemented AI functionality into manned turrets. Like other objects that NPCs need to be able to use, the turrets have been set up as usables, which describes the logic and animations required to use them. As with the player, animations are synchronized with the turret movement so that the AI grips the turret by its handles while rotating on the spot to aim horizontally and tilts the turret up and down to aim vertically. 
The team also worked on implementing a wide range of panic, cower, and surrender behaviors for both unarmed civilians and enemy NPCs that have run out of ammunition and weapons. If an unarmed civilian sees that an enemy has an unholstered weapon, they will notify characters nearby using a wild line and then panic run to a hidden point of cover. They will continue to run away from an enemy from the enemy if their cover is compromised. Unarmed characters that hear this information will turn to react to the enemy and then panic themselves. By randomizing the speed at which the NPCs react, the devs can generate natural looking range of behaviors from crowd responding to a threat. Man, it's gonna be funny to walk up to the dude who's got his back turned <laughs> with a gun out. And the guy's like the last one to realize. He looks around and he's like, why is everyone running? And turns around and goes, oh, and runs. <laughs> And this is all stuff that's features on, on civilian AI and behavior, which is nice. Armed enemies that have run out of ammo and weapons will cover while searching for valid ammo and weapons to pick up. Again, if their cover is exposed, they will reevaluate and run to a new position. If the player aims at an armed, an armed or unarmed NPC, they will stay at the spot but turn to face the player and move through a sequence of surrender animations whilst communicating with the player. As part of combat, the team worked on the medic AI behaviors to allow NPCs to find incapacitated peers that need reviving and use med pens to get them back into the fight. This involved bringing together numerous existing functionalities from various areas, including the usable system, use channel to revive, consumable items, the med pen, synchronized animations between two NPCs, ragdoll into animations to allow characters to stand up from ragdoll, and subsumption to script the behavior. The next stage is integrating this behavior with the standard react to presumed dead bodies behavior to generate more complex behaviors. AI features also started to work on the new non-human character. This is not Vanduul, by the way. 100% this is not Vanduul. Because they mention Vanduul characters when they talk about Vanduul. Saying non-human and character implies this is an AI, or not AI, this is a um, another one of the races. So, Jian, Tavarin, or Banu. We don't know, because all three could actually be involved in Squadron 42. Tavarin are often in the military, they often serve in the fleet. The Banu are, we saw references to the Banu in one of the side missions uh, for the, the vertical slice, so they could be there. And the Xi'an, I know, are referenced in Squadron 42 as well. So that's interesting. This involved creating a new core set of animations for the new creature and slotting it into an existing framework. From there, they're able to rapidly develop the core functionality, which was passed to the design team for feedback. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. <laughs> Towards the end of the year, a few areas of work were revised to tidy up loose ends. The first of these was the Vanduul. See, so I've said it. They, they mentioned the Vanduul. They would have said Vanduul if it was Vanduul. Investigation behavior during the cat and mouse gameplay section. Vanduul now investigate the floor vents in the room with different animations to different alert alertness levels. Oof. Splinter Cell with Vanduul. <laughs> Uh, for those of you who don't know, there's also a behavior that Vanduul have where if they get in melee, you will have to dodge. Dark Souls style. <laughs> out of the way. There is some Dark Souls stuff in Star Citizen, and it's very funny. Uh, soul Citizen. Uh, oh, Soul Citizen. Uh, a dark, citi a dark Citizen. Uh, and now there's going to be some, some stealth gameplay, which is interesting. After feedback from the design team, new functionalities were added for the accuracy calculation. This included adding a mercy timer, firing time, and time since seen accuracy modifiers. The mercy timer gives the player a fighting chance to escape from heavy fire by making the AI inaccurate for a set period when the player's health has reached a certain threshold. So they're adding stormtrooper aim when you are super low in health. The firing time accuracy modifier reduces the accuracy over firing periods for similar purposes. Time since seen added accuracy modifier allows the player a grace period after moving out of cover during which the attacker's accuracy will be lower. The accuracy distance calculation was also changed to be curve based for greater control. Trying to simulate, I guess it's also simulation. 
if you don't know where someone is and someone just suddenly jer jerks out of cover, you probably won't have as accurate of a shot on somebody. And the same thing with if you see somebody who is really wounded and trying to move away, you might hesitate before you try to kill them simply because, you know, part of you take over, especially if you're not fully uh, aware of the situation. <clears throat> All right. That's really cool. That's a lot of stuff they've worked on. This is all stuff which is on top of the features we saw at CitizenCon. This is all much more, they're using the same system though. They use this system called, the, like I think it's called the tag system that they use. They can just slap tags onto, uh, onto them which will represent different behaviors which will affect how the AI react to certain situations, so. All right, AI tech. During the last month of 2022, the AI tech team progressed with features feature required for both Persistent Universe and Squadron 42. The team continued to, continue to iterate on more complex navigation links to allow to extend the capabilities of NPCs and where they're able to move, including implementing adapters for airlocks and elevators. Now NPCs will know in, uh, that in order to traverse an airlock, they will need to interact with multiple consoles to adjust pressure and open the door. I was going to sneeze and now I can't. <laughs> I'll sneeze after, I, after I've unmuted myself. For um, now, NPCs will know in order to traverse an airlock, they'll need to interact with multiple consoles to adjust the pressure and open the door. For elevators, navigation links were created to connect multiple floors. A navigation link was also created to request reconnection with navigation mesh triangles each time an elevator stops at a floor to allow NPCs to transition in and out. Based on the navigation link uh, connections, an NPC will now know how to request an elevator to go to a specific floor. New event notifications were also added, sent by the elevator when it arrives at the floor so that the actor will know to get on or off. At the end of the year, the base functionality for NPCs driving ground vehicles was completed. NPCs can now move a vehicle and get to the into the driver's seat. Find a path suitable for the size of the vehicle and drive along uh, Drive along it. This work involved the creation of new subsumption tasks, a new movement request type, and updating the movement planner to know how to process this request. The team also added new functionality to the navigation systems that marks entities to be ignored during navigation mesh generation. NPC perception was another major topic worked on towards the end of the year. The team implemented a new adapter to for action areas to specify lightness slash darkness, which will influence NPCs' visual perception. A new extender to propagate engine sounds with uh, uh, stimuli was also created. This will make the NPCs aware of vehicles in their proximity. This was the first step towards behaviors that will react to ground vehicles in spaceships. While working on perception improvements, the devs fixed AI visual perception through glass. Now, NPCs will be able to detect targets behind glass and also understand that in order to shoot them, they need to move to the other side. For locomotion, imp uh, improvements in uh, continued on the sharp turn assets and how they're triggered for alien characters or at walking speeds. Related to this, the work began on following tech, which will be used in connection with buddy AI behavior. For this, the team improved soft steps, soft stops, collision avoidance with players, and speed handling based on the leader's change in speed. For the Apollo Subsumption tool, new functionality was added to create and modify the Subsumption Master Graph. A lot of feedback from the designers was implemented, including the addition of an interface to create roles and sub-roles, find reference functionality, improved interaction with functions and the multi-graph tab, and improvements to grid snapping. So all of that was the same stuff that was in the Squadron 42 update, or Star Citizen update, but all, with connections to all of this other stuff, it makes a lot more sense. They spent a lot of time in November and December working on civilian AI tech, effectively, and finished up their uh, their vehicle stuff. They had been working on vehicle, NPCs using vehicles and reacting to vehicles for a while. So like you can shoot as, NPCs can now shoot at ships with their M FPS weapons or shoot at vehicles with their FPS weapons. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes on. It's also important to remember that none of this tech is in Star Citizen right now nor will it be implemented until after 4.0. At 
or after 4.0 is released. So a lot of this stuff is still waiting for server meshing before it can end up in Star Citizen. But it's first being developed for Squadron. So AI vehicles. The vehicle feature team worked on significant improvements and features for Flight AI, including largely completing their work on several sections involving ships attacking actors on ground. This work involves around the redesign of the core combat logic. We're working towards more varied and interesting ship combat experience than before, so we're planning out and making changes to combat AI and testing them in Squadron 42 to get the experience we want. AI vehicle team. All right, pretty good. Like I said, they're talking about the um, the the ability to react to and fire at other players or AI on ships or vehicles. And then also those vehicles and ships uh, being able to fire at ground targets. You can sort of see that in 318 because when you get into a ship at 318, you will actually see, at one point you could see the entirety of the local AI population walking around with your HUD. So there is some aspects of this which is trying to be transitioned over to it. Animation. Last month of 2022 saw gameplay animation working on Vandal executions, zero-g player movement, and various animation sets for background life. They also added skill level variation to takedowns alongside new weapons. They then shot mocap for a variety of additional scenes and gameplay needed to create facial animations for various story and background characters. Ah, I think it's almost the same thing as the Star Citizen one, but I think that was, I thought that was maybe for trailers and such. I guess that was meant for Squadron, which makes more sense. Uh, but yeah, Vandal Executions and then kind of different, different stuff like that, so yeah. Art Characters. The concept artist working, worked on tattoo and armor variation concepts for the Screaming Galsons to help fill out the faction and continue to work on the campaign, uh, uh, on a key campaign character. The Screaming Galsons are a pirate faction. Uh, they are one of the major antagonists of Squadron 42, as far as I can tell. They have a huge amount of work that have been put into them, um, which is different from the one we know about, which is known as OMC. So they may be more of an overt antagonist. OMC are kind of like the shadowy in the background guys. We don't, we don't really know that right now. But the Galsons are definitely, they've been mentioned in lore. We know they exist. We know they're a pirate faction. Uh, artists also continue working on the Scheme and Galson's armor alongside the Navy pilot flight suit and a new creature. New creature. There we go. Tech art skin, the Navy, uh, the main Navy jumpsuit, and paired assets for deck crew, engineers, and gunners. Right. Art environment. Environment art approached content complete on several chapter locations, including chapters 7 and 11. New assets, uh, asset kits were currently in progress to help flesh out spacescaping for flight-based chapters, while Vandu ship, Vandal ship work continues as the team prepares for, to hand them over to be set up. So yeah, uh, effectively, from chapters 5 through 20 are the heavy focus that they've been working on right now. So that checks out as well. All right. I am not an engine seer. I'm not a tech priest. I am not a Starfleet engineer. I am not an engineer. I'm not, I'm not part of the, the, the Forerunner's creations to disassemble and reassemble a, 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 a freaking <laughs> a electric car by rote memory. I can't do any of those things. I am not fluent in engine speak. If you are, please let me know in the comments below. Now, this is almost certainly the same thing we saw from the Squadron 42 or Star Citizen Monthly Report, which we did last week. Uh, and as far as I could tell, someone posted that uh, this is just optimizations. It's effectively what the engine was this this uh, this month, these last months. They just focus on optimizations. But I'm still going to read through it just in case you care more about Squadron 42 than Star Citizen. You didn't read the, watch the Star Citizen one, or you just want to hear both at the same time. It's okay, I understand. I have a very, very soothing voice. So let's get on to the engine section. November and December were busy months for the physics team. Aside from plenty of bug fixing and supporting Alpha 318, they worked on various optimizations. For example, the cost of performing a part OBB versus grid cell overlap checks was armatized. Amor it 
amortized, amortized by performing them in one call for a grid node instead of cell by cell. Also, substepping for attached and AI-controlled NPCs on the server was disabled to bring back actor entity step performance. Several internal data structures were compacted and reordered for a smaller memory footprint and better member alignment. On the renderer, the team enabled the Gen 12 pipeline and scene rendered by default. This will be featured in Alpha 318 which is a major milestone on the road towards completing Gen 12 transition and providing a Vulkan backend. For, uh, following October's work on particles, further substantial progress was made. Gen 12 refraction and half-resolution rendering support for GPU particles was added. The particle stage and GPU handler refactored, and, a, and particle shader background compilation was enabled. Furthermore, particles split for each hierarchy level are now updated in a way that ensures UAV resources stay consistent across each patch, across each pass, and don't change. Moreover, debug visualization code for various systems was ported to Gen 12, and PSO caching for projectiles and particles was improved. Regarding atmosphere and volumetric clouds, an initial draft of a new temporal render mode was submitted and will continue to be worked on in the coming months to provide better rendering performance of raymarched volumetric clouds and atmosphere. Furthermore, various options for refined cloud shaping were brainstormed with tech art and will hopefully find their way to release soon. On Core Engine, the team completed work on V2 of pack data file support for game engine, or for the engine, game and tool side. On that note, the system now also provides an efficient lock mechanism for legacy pack files, as well as a much faster access to files inside pack files, embed, embedded in the main P4K data file, both of which significantly improve the loading of object containers. Additionally, the mapping of threads on Intel CPUs with P/E cores was rewritten. Critical threads such as main, render, and network threads are ensured to always run on performance cores to avoid the otherwise poor performance on affected CPUs. These changes are currently being modified on the PTU. Also, the port for page sizes larger than four kilobytes, AKA huge pages, which added to the engine at the moment on Linux only. It's currently used for stack text and data segments, as well as physics allocations. Using huge pages reduces the pressure on the TLB cache the part of the CPU uh, translating visual, virtual to physical addresses, which should help with performance. With Clang, just moving the text segments uh, to huge pages gave a 7% speed up. Furthermore, the latest version of Bl uh, Bl Bink 2 was integrated and a few audio related bugs fixed on video playback, manifesting themselves as random clicks during playback. Another area that progressed well was the remote shader compile server used to build shader caches, etc. Due to increasing usage of the server by development teams and the build processes, proper support for fallback agents as well as server throttling was implemented to deal, uh, implemented to deal with times of extreme load and allow for more distributed compilation. At that point, it made sense to rewrite various parts of the server code to allow more robustness, better logging, and increased performance. Lastly, shape unification was completed and entity area support was added, a copy slash paste bug in the entity aggregate manager that caused a lot of unnecessary memory access was fixed and viz area loading was refactored to support batch conversion from previous versions of sterilized viz area data. A lot of that is just optimizations making things better, which is generally what engine is doing at this point is trying to improve the current situation uh, with some new additions in the back end, not, usually not too much. All right. <clears throat> features vehicle. Last two months of the year saw fe vehicle features largely completing a full rework of quantum travel, which is being integrated into Squadron 42 for testing. This continues to be the uh, continues from the quantum boost feature me mentioned in previous reports and significantly improves the overall feature implementation. They also supported the VFX team in integrating new effects for quantum travel. So they're mostly done with the rework for quantum travel. So it sounds like they're effectively done. That's the quantum boost and all that other stuff that people have been losing their mind about. 
They also worked on a recall feature available for various military ships in the game. This uses AI pathfinding tech used in the PU and will allow various Squadron or two levels to be completed. This means that you will be able to, I think, recall your ship. If you are out of your ship, the ship will then fly to you so you can get in your ship and fly away. Obviously, to complete a mission, you need to be able to get out of there. Now, I don't know if those recall features, I think a lot of people got super excited about, oh, I can call my ship by AI and I can go just get into it and fly away in game. I don't think that's gonna happen in Star Citizen. I think it's a Squadron 42 thing only. Which we've seen on the mobile glass of them of being able to recall your ship with squad, the Squadron 42 mobile glass. I don't think we're gonna see that in Star Citizen, but we might. It just has been only mentioned in Squadron 42. So I wouldn't put any, um, kind of baggage towards that or any kind of uh, hopes towards that. Vehicle features then completed a significant refactor of the aiming system and are currently working with UI to implement new aiming reticles and pips to go alongside it. This will result in a huge performance improvements in aiming accuracy and reliability. It's currently being tested to improve in combat experience. Different reticles, I guess, okay. Significant time towards the end of 2022 went into multifunction display, MFD, heads-up display, HUD, and vehicle UI reworks. The based MFD system is making huge strides and were partially implemented most of the core MFD screens for ships using the new building block system. We're just starting to build the new HUD, which deeply integrates the MFD system with the configuration options, the MFD casting, uh, casting options, vehicle feature scene. This is interesting because this is a brand new system. They've mentioned this before of the old new HUD, but they had been working on variations of the HUD and I think they completely threw it out. So I think we're, they're going on a brand new HUD and haven't told us that the current HUD that, that was the new HUD is old now. They've thrown it out and gone back to, 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 to scraps from the starting points. That is very interesting. Because CIG doesn't like to admit when they throw it out. But the HUD we have right now is an old HUD that is legacy. It's probably going to go away. As of this, this, this reading and other re references in the past, it is gone. Which means that explains why the Drake HUD and the Aegis HUD, which we saw being at various stages of development, haven't come out yet because they scrapped it and didn't tell us. That is a problem though, because I think that indicates that CIG isn't willing to tell us when they've entirely scrapped something. Tell us these things, CIG. It, it helps people understand because a lot of people have been waiting for the new HUD system and they haven't had any updates. Knowing that, hey, we scrapped this, we're going back to basics, people would still be mad, but they wouldn't be as mad as, or it wouldn't be as, as wondering. They'd be like, cool, we can't wait to see the new one. People are generally understanding and I think most people would rather know than not know. Control services continue to develop and in the last two months, the team improved stalling and transitions. For example, when the ship detects it's about to stall, it can automatically enable thrusters to stop it from falling. Similarly, when a ship has detected it's going fast enough to sustain control flights, uh, to sustain control surface flight, it can automatically shut down its maneuvering thrusters and start flying solely with control surfaces. This is greatly improving the atmospheric flight sections of the campaign. That is very cool. That means we're going to see the control surfaces be, it's used at least in Squadron 42, be implemented, and then it obviously it'll be poured over to Star Citizen, which is a cool idea, and means that ships that are more like planes, the Arrow, the Gladius, and so on, will likely have better fuel efficiency in atmosphere than they currently do because they don't have to worry about using their thrusters as much. It's very cool. All right. Gameplay story. Gameplay story worked on a range of different tasks during November and December, including preparing and shooting mocap to update various scenes. Mocap from previous shoots were, was also used, for example, to help characters climb back into ships after speaking with a player. A scene in Chapter 8 was updated to ensure the character could interact with a variety of props instead of just performing visual inspections. The team made sure the character used AI poses to allow them to break out of the scene if needed. The character also interacts well with the Argo MPUV, meaning they can fly into the Idris before starting their scene.
Our short king is a main ship in Squadron 42. Confirmed. Send it into the hills. The Argo MPUV is a flyable ship in Squadron 42. Heck yeah. <laughs> All hail our short orange king. Which also makes sense because we've actually seen some of the, some rework and updates that they've been trying to make to it. So, Another area further explored was unholstering and holstering. This time, the team was able to make a character grab the multi-tool and data pad from the exact position it attaches, uh, it attaches to the character and place it back. <laughs> Interesting. By the way, with the MPUV, that means that we may actually see, I don't think we will, I'd love to see, uh, a MPUV only flight, uh, like like run of Squadron 42. That would be interesting as hell. See, I do please. Uh, completely scrap the entire, entire game just for that and just make that a possibility. <laughs> um, a number of updates were also made to characters in chapters four and eight. This involved utilizing the latest female walk cycle to enable the AI to seamlessly enter and exit scenes. A significant update was made to a scene in chapter 13 with the team adjusting animations to work with the final geometry of the level, making it so the character can speak to the player from a better position. A major review of scenes that had been worked on throughout the past year was always done too. This led to increased animation quality, either by reusing the latest mocap or fixing what was already in place. Many new animations were created and polish passes were done on animations to further improve scenes alongside general maintenance and, maintenance and bug fixing. All right. Graphics and VFX programming. The VFX programming team began implementing new quantum travel and boost effects. These effects are now in basic functional state and are triggering at the general and correct time. Work will continue to expose timing controls and implement the functionality for adapting these effects to any size ship. Work on the fire hazard system is wrapping up again, starting with the implementation implementing request for controlling fire and its propagation for design purposes. On the visual side, the team are currently planning out the work required for reaching the visual goals set by the VFX art. Okay, so we seem like the quantum travel and quantum boost stuff is starting to become more finalized. And remember, this is all stuff from November, December of last year. Level design. The social team progressed well in the final months of 2022, including continued scene work on their assigned chapters. New onboarding documentation was also created to better support new starters. Very cool. Yeah, so uh, for those of you who don't know, Squadron 42 is broken up into three different level types, FPS, social, and flight. Uh, so I guess it's just the social team, social team's working on some new stuff as well. So you can think of this kind of like uh, Mass Effect, where you have the the on flight, you know, like the, the the combat roles, and then you have the on the ship, and you're kind of doing social stuff. Uh, but you also add the you know flight and um, kind of combat, flight combat versus on foot combat, and all of these are interchangeable. So you could have a social scene that turns into an FPS scene, which turns into a flight scene, or whatever. They they kind of flow within one one another, but they're built separately for different teams. Narrative. November and December were busy months for narrative team. Firstly, they had a week-long performance capture shoot in the UK to close out capturing wild lines for one of the enemy factions, probably the Galsons, as well as narrative content scenes for a set piece. They also picked up content to support the new dynamic conversation system that will provide exciting opportunities for NPCs to chat with one another. This opens up a lot of opportunities for contextual conversations that can help maintain the illusion of life and storytelling outside of dedicated scripted scenes. When in Star Citizen CIG, that is desperately needed in Star Citizen. Cool, I like it, but also an SC, please. The team continued to hold reviews on the various design teams to, de help the, to develop updated scripts and provide placeholder recordings. This is to ensure that lines are not only creating the right dramatic beats, but also creating, also clearly indicating what the player is meant to do in order to progress. Narrative also met with characters to ensure that all necessary costumes have been requested to support the various chapters that specific NPCs appear in. Based on the scope of the script, it shouldn't come as a surprise that there's a lot of characters that players will meet over the course of the game. 
This list is compl uh, complicated by the fact that some of the characters will have a schedule that will drive them to work from, from work to rest, necessitating a variety of clothing to be available. Costume changes for characters. That's interesting. That's, I, I don't think I've seen many games that do that, where you have different costumes for the same character that'll depend on when they are. That would be kind of interesting. Uh, yeah, and, and for those of you who don't know, uh, the game is anywhere, like the main story campaign, last we heard, was about 20 hours, with the full optional stuff uh, adding to about 40 hours of gameplay. So this isn't like a like a four-hour COD gameplay, sort of like COD campaign. This is a massive, massive gameplay uh, compared to, like I said, I compare it more to Mass Effect, because it's uh, probably the closest you're going to see in modern gaming to what Squad 4Q is attempting. All right, tech animation. Tech animation spent the end of the year focusing on head asset processing. We've taken some long overdue actors and started to the internal processing procedure to create their likenesses. This includes creating over 78 scans per head asset and processing them to the neutral head asset. Some of these actors were scanned over seven years ago uh, on the main shoot for Squadron 42. They look quite different these days. Tech animation team. The team, uh, take these complex scans and break them down into individual muscle movements and apply them to the facial rig asset, ultimately including them in the gene pool, gene pool to give more variety to the heads and faces seen in the game. Very cool. VFX. Through November and December, the VFX team progressed on the particle library overhaul. This included creating a custom level showing all the available effects. This is useful for VFX artists to quickly view the effect libraries. Artists also continued to support art design teams on key locations and cinematic scenes. Elsewhere, working alongside VFX programmers, the new quantum level tra tra quantum travel effects were made functional. Previously, they were in engine prototypes. Having seen these effects work working properly, there is still some tweaking to be done to better match the prototype. Here we go. So, this is a fairly robust aspect. Some of the stuff is similar stuff, uh, VFX stuff, tech animation, the narrative uh, showing that there's going to be multiple character costumes for characters, depending on their, their cycles. So a lot of the same AI behavior we'll see in Squadron in Star Citizen will also be in Squadron 42 in terms of having a schedule. Uh, social team was working a little bit. We see some new tr quantum travel. The new quantum travel stuff is getting more, more fo focused. The Argo MPUV is confirmed flyable. <laughs> uh some mocap stuff done, some story stuff. MFD system is completely overhauled. They've completely thrown out the old MFD with a new MFD, which we've heard a little bit before, but now it's a kind of more confirmed and it's using the, or we already knew that, the H, the HUD. The MFD is actually informing the HUD creation is what, I, what we're guessing, but the MFD is almost completely done on building blocks. Um, this is again, back in December. Uh, November, December. Engine, lots of optimizations. Uh, they Content complete on several chapters, including chapter 7 and 11. The Screaming Galson's got a bunch of stuff. The Navy Jumpsuit's got updated. Uh, Vandal Executions, Player Zero-G Movement, Background Life stuff, uh, AI Vehicles, being able to... Uh, attack characters on the ground, AI tech, a lot of being able to drive AI NPCs, being able to get in and drive vehicles, as well as uh, following tech. And then we've got the extended issue of AI features where AIs can surrender a lot of civilian overhaul for like civilian kind of behaviors in, in war zones, as well as more cat and mouse and the mention of a new creature. A creature which we haven't heard, or a new character, character, creature character, alien creature kind of thing. Not Vanduul, not human, but probably not like the Whip Crab or the the Boreal Stalker. We're, we're talking like possibly Tavarin, uh, Bandu, Ban Bandu, Banu, or Jean. So interesting to see that. Plus, again, more stuff for. Uh, AI content with being able to swap out multi-tools, being able to do things like welding and such. So a lot of AI stuff for Squadron Rig 2, honestly. But that was, it's pretty extensive. Now, I, as always, I wanna hear what you think about this in the comments below. Let me know that. 
And of course, join us live Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, with these wonderful folks here, and discuss these as we talk about them live. And lastly, I do say this because it does help me understand, do you find this helpful? If you find this helpful, let me know in the comments because I do these to try to help y'all kind of fully get the context, especially since I always hear people say, Squadron Order 2, where's Squadron Order 2? What's going on with Squadron Order 2? And we have this asset, which not a lot of people know exists, where they talk about what's going on, what's being worked on with Squadron 42. Now, of course, we don't have, we don't know what percentage it's done, but we do know what is that, the content that's being worked on. And there's some interesting insights into the game while we're reading this. As well. But let me know if this is valuable as well. And like I say every time, hope to see you someday in the black.